test one. Good evening, everyone. We're delighted to welcome you to the 100Ks Accelerate Award. This is the number two in 100Ks three phases of awards. We are tonight, we're awarding over $15,000 of non-dilutive funding to our 13 finalists. My name is Sam Oppenheimer. I'm one of the managing directors of the 100K. I'm here along Brittany and Jana who are marshalling those stragglers through the choke point of the elevator up into the stage. Tonight, we're going to start off with two-minute pitches from our 13 finalists, followed by four minutes of questions from the judging team to dive into their ideas. After that, the finalists will repair to their booths that you may have seen coming in, and you will have a chance to ask your own questions and answers, to get your hands on the demos. This is a prototyping focus startup competition, to get your hands to see what they've put together. While you're mingling with the teams, the judges will debate and come to a decision about who they see as the people they want to choose. They're going to decide today's $10,000 first place award, second place award for $3,000, and third for $1,000. It is important that whilst you are mingling and checking with them, you, the audience, get to choose tonight's audience choice award. That is $1,000. Vote via the QR code. Finally, so talk a little bit about the Accelerate competition. Oh, I missed this slide. I was meant to bring it up earlier. Um, talk about a little bit about the Accelerate competition. We had 76 applications and 48 expert judges across venture capital and the startup ecosystem to get to these 13 finalists. Before we kick off this evening, I would like to thank our sponsors. None of these awards are possible without our sponsors. I want to first start with Akamai. Akamai is an incredible success story that started with 100K a few decades. They present the first place award tonight, which is in memory of Danny Lewin, the incredible Akamai founder. I want to hand over to Ron Cheney to talk a little bit about Danny Lewin. Thanks a lot, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here. Akamai is proud once again to be the sponsor of the Danny Lewin Award. The late Danny Lewin was co-founder of Akamai, along with MIT professor Tom Layton, who now serves as Akamai's CEO. Before coming to MIT, Danny served as an officer in an elite Israeli commando unit, received degrees from the Technion University, and worked as a research fellow at IBM's research laboratory in Haifa. Danny was a graduate student in the lab for computer science, which is now part of CSAIL, with Tom as his advisor. Danny won several awards, including the 1978 Morris Lewis, Morris Joseph Lewin Award for Best Masterworks Thesis Presentation at MIT. Danny's master's thesis included some of the fundamental algorithms that make up the core of Akamai's services to this day. In 1998, Danny and Tom entered uh, the central idea that later became Akamai in the MIT 50K competition, as it was known back then. Although the Akamai co concept lost, the competition set Tom and Danny on a path to creating and building Akamai, which today is a $3.8 billion company. Danny often said that although Akamai would have innovative ideas, great people, and terrific technology, the most important factor to Akamai's success would be tenacity, a word that best describes Danny. Danny perished on the American Airlines Flight 11 in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He was one of the many heroes on that day. Danny's spirit of innovation and drive for excellence motiv motivates us continuously. 
Akamai congratulates all the teams uh, competing here tonight. Danny would have been inspired by your creativity, your hard work, and especially your tenacity. Thank you. Danny Lewin sat in a similar seat in a similar competition just a short while ago. I also want to talk a little bit about some of our other gifts that make the 100K possible. We are very fortunate to have a gift from Morgan Thaler who makes this competition possible. I want to thank them especially for their very serious support. And now I'm going to hand over to Brittany, my much better and much more clever managing director partner. So in addition to thanking our sponsors, we wanted to take the time to thank our organizing committee coming together to put countless hours in to pull off this event in store for you tonight. Throughout the showcase, many of us will be working behind the scenes to make this experience as engaging as possible for everyone. Now moving on to our judges, um, we are deeply grateful for their presence this evening and we thank each judge for giving up their time tonight. Our judges are distinguished members of the Boston startup ecosystem, and I wanted to give a short introduction for each judge. First, we have Robin Chase, who is the co-founder and former CEO of Zipcar, the world's leading card share network. She's also the co-founder of Numo, an alliance organization that leverages tech-based disruption in the transport sector to create sustainable and just mobility. She also founded and led startups focused on ride sharing, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, and vehicle network communications. And she has many awards in the areas of innovation, design, and environment, including the prestigious Urban Land Institute Urban Visionary Prize, Time 100 Most Influential People, Fast Company Fast 50 Innovators, and Business Week Top 10 Designers. She graduated from Wellesley College and MIT Sloan School of Management, was a Harvard University Loeb Fellow, and received an honorary doctorate of design from the Illinois Institute of Technology. Next, we have Carolina, who is originally from Argentina. She studied business administration and got a master's of finance while also working as a full-time controller at DirecTV. She moved to Boston in 2018 to study to get an MBA at MIT Sloan as well. And after graduating, she founded Better Vet, which is a mobile veterinary care company that raised $40 million in 2022 and operates in 20 different markets within the US. And then Jan is going to introduce the other two judges. Hello. So the next two judges, um, Kevin Matsarmi. Um, he is a distinguished figure in the technology sector, sector, recognized for his expertise in artificial intelligence, investing, and entrepreneurial ventures. Currently serving as a principal at Remus Cap Capital, he co-leads um, AI investing efforts, focusing on early startups from angel investments uh, to Series A rounds. Prior to this, he was a graduate researcher at the MIT Department of Computer Science and CSAIL. His hands-on experience also extends to roles as a software engineer at Included Health and various startups, founding his own nonprofit organization, Gates Inc. Sri Solar is our, our fourth but not least judge, uh, the CEO of Kenmore and Brands, where he orchestrated the successful turnaround and transformation of Kenmore and, and Die Hard following the Sears bankruptcy. With a career as Chief Product Officer and GM at Berkshire Gray and Shark Ninja, Shree's career includes roles as SVP of Product and Engineering at Comcast, where he launched products like Xfinity, Xfinity, Z, Xfinity Z5 and as a um, General Manager at HP, where he built the wearables business for brands such as Coach and Hugo Boss. Um, Shri also founded Cloud Print, a pioneering service for wireless printing. I'm sorry, there's two more bullets. <laughs> Shri holds an electronics communication engineering degree um, from NIT in India and an MBA from Boston University. Outside of work, he's an avid trail runner, an avid trail runner. Um, okay, so to kick things off, um, what we're all here for. Um, Adelant AI, if you can come to the stage, you are the first. So what's going to happen is 
Um, we'll have two minutes per pitch, and then uh, four minutes for questions from the judges. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Utkarsh, and I'm the founder of Adalat AI. I started my career as a lawyer at the Indian Supreme Court, where I practiced for many years. I was a law clerk with a judge of the Supreme Court. And finally, my partner and I were petitioners at the Indian Supreme Court trying to legalize same-sex marriage. But in each of these situations, I realized that I was helpless at the front end of the legal system when the back end of the legal system was completely broken. India has 50 million cases pending in courts today. Each case takes over 12 years to be resolved by the system, and at our current pace, it will take us 300 years to clear the backlog. This means prisoners simply languish in prisons, waiting for their cases to start. The process has become the punishment, and justice is elusive. That's why I launched Adalat AI, a legal tech nonprofit that's building AI solutions customized for the needs of courtrooms in the global south to end judicial delays and improve access to justice. Our first product is a speech-to-text AI transcription software specifically designed for legal language because an acute shortage of stenographers becomes a huge holdup in courtrooms. We are partnering with four states across the country, have already completed pilots, and found that our product, on average, cuts the case resolution time by half and actually increases court capacity by 40% on a weekly basis. I, have, I studied law at Harvard Law School, economics at MIT in Oxford, I worked at BCG and the World Bank and worked at the government of India and the courts, and I'm now bringing this interdisciplinary background to solve this multidimensional problem. When I was a lawyer, the glamorous thing used to be to get one bail in one courtroom or to argue a civil rights case in another courtroom. But imagine the hundreds of thousands of bails we will unleash in the system and the thousands of more civil rights cases we will enable in the system by simply converting words into justice, by bringing tech to courtrooms, and I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Um, that was compelling. But can you repeat for me the precise product? As I understand it, it's text, speech, speech to text. Why does that give you, where does that fit into the, why does it make it go faster? Absolutely. So let me paint what a courtroom is like for you and how, why this is a holdup. 10% of courtrooms have stenographers, and they are unskilled, untrained typists who type with two fingers, and I have to work with them for the deposition to be typed. So if I say, Robin, where were you that night? I will look at the steno, and they will slowly type, where were you that night? And then when you respond, they will slowly type, and then we will argue about what you said because it's all being done manually. In the 90% of the remaining courtrooms, there are no stenographers, so judges are writing everything by hand which means they scribble, write everything by hand, and I have to wait for them to finish, and the judicial record is handwritten. If judges get transferred, the next judge doesn't understand what's written, becoming a massive pain point, becoming slow and efficient, and really compromising judicial quality. Our product is an aid to either that stenographer or to the judge, depending on the context, to automate this very simple speech-to-text transcription, fine-tuned on legal data so that it actually understands legal jargon, and automates this manual process to liberate judges from these clerical tasks so that can, they can focus on their core judicial tasks and actually dispense justice. Uh, just to be clear, it's just for the India market? No, that's a great question. So because my background and the team's background is in India, we're starting in India, but this is actually a gl global problem across the global south. And one of the silver linings, I guess, of colonialism and a common English law background is multiple countries have the same legal system. So we already have interests from Nigeria, Kenya, and Bangladesh, and we are in conversations with them to understand how to replicate this. It's going to be quite simple because, as I said, the legal system is very similar, but we want to first stay focused, do a good job in India before we can consider expanding beyond India. You spoke about a 40% increase in, you know, uh, in, in terms of cycle time. Aren't there other aspects of the bureaucracy that's stopping you? You could be really amazingly fast, but just like in an assembly line, the slowest process defines the speed. Um, what are you doing to take care of that problem? Absolutely. I mean, this is not a silver bullet. This is a multidimensional problem. But the reason we started with this is because in a courtroom, 
every word has to be written down at every stage of the process. So when the petition is filed, to oral arguments, to cross-examinations, to even the preparation of the judgment, that this is probably the only solution that touches every part of the case law supply chain as you described and automates it. But that's not, that's not why we don't stop here. We're not a transcription company. The ambition is to build a portfolio of AI products that will include things like calendaring because aligning multiple calendars to give dates in courtrooms is incredibly challenging. It'll include a CRM system because the poor court master and staff has to use a notebook to align Manage, managing stakeholders who are police officers, forensic labs, witnesses, petitioners, victims, lawyers, and judges, which you and I couldn't do. is an incredibly uphill task, and it's right now being done by pen and paper. So with this portfolio of products, we will start uh, dealing with other parts of the supply chain to automate and liberate the courts from these delays. Thank you. Thank you. Who do you sell to specifically? We work directly with the courts, so because of this massive movement with digitization and public administration through Aadhaar and the Unified pay like Payment Infrastructure, UPI, there are now budgets, especially post-pandemic, because everything went virtual. So our direct client is the court and the Ministry of Law, and uh, the systems are implemented directly in the IT infrastructure inside the courtrooms, which is why this is only possible through partnerships with courts, and I think that's why we have a huge advantage, because I was a law clerk, I'm a, I'm a lawyer from the system, and I can leverage those networks to actually partner with courts and, and implement them deep inside the IT back end of the courtrooms. Now announcing, uh, thank you, Adelaide. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Irene and we are Bridge Health AI, bridging gaps in access so that healthcare can be simple for everyone in America. This is very personal to me. 30 years ago, when my parents came to the United States, they were poor and didn't speak English very well. Government benefits helped them survive, but many things were still too complicated to figure out. So my dad has a chronic condition that he delayed getting treatment for for years and it still seriously affects his health to today. And he's not alone. Over 100 million Americans aren't getting access to health and social benefits that they are eligible for because healthcare is too confusing and frustrating. These missed opportunities will be very costly for the US, rising to $1 trillion by 2040. And that's why we're bridging, building Bridge Health AI, an intuitive benefits navigation platform powered by AI to simplify health and social benefits across the entire journey, starting from identifying the needs to finding relevant benefits, enrollment and education and follow up so that families will never be left without care. This is a large and growing market. We're focused on Beachhead, which is managed Medicaid. That's the 70% of Medicaid that's managed by private corporations like Aetna and United Healthcare. Um, and it's worth 400 billion. There is a high incentive to reduce costs. And so we've refined a business model with multiple value drivers for those different stakeholders. In this space, the current solutions are failing because they are fragmented, clunky, and slow. And we at Bridge know that in order to truly reinvent the last mile of access, we need to take a comprehensive approach guided by a simple interface that does the heavy lifting so that the paperwork that is currently drowning our users can be done in minutes instead of weeks. We currently have a version one prototype, we have three verbal agreements to pilot, and our team knows that we can help millions of Americans just like my parents 30 years ago. Thank you. So who is your first, you, who are you gonna, who's your first demographic that you're going to practice? Yeah, so our customers will be the managed Medicaid health plans. The users will be the care worker teams for our first product. Um, so social workers, nurses, community health workers, and then the end beneficiaries are the patients who will interact with it a little bit as well. Can you describe what the product looks like exactly and what's the AI component of it? 
Yeah, it's really just a one simple web interface. Um, it's mainly a chatbot copilot that has um, like big brain AI in the background. It's not all generative AI, a lot of it is algorithmic, especially for eligibility checking. But so for example, it'll have um, guided prompting for the social needs screener. Like if you have unstable housing, are you also food insecure? And kind of guide through that process. Um, it does a much better matching for relevant benefits than current competitors. Um, and then automated form fill. So I talked to a social worker recently who in the Boston area, some people fill up to 40 different housing applications um, to try to find stable housing. And that involves a social worker sitting with the patient going line by line through a 30 page PDF when we can use the same information or information that already exists in an EHR to populate that more easily. Um, and then, you know, follow up prompts. Um, what does it actually mean to use your EBT card if you're on SNAP or what grocery stores in your neighborhood accept it. Um, if you need to schedule non-emergency medical transportation, not everyone knows that you need to do that 72 hours in advance. So just making sure that there's like an automated guide every step of the way. Can you highlight, um, you said three verbal agreements for a pilot. Can you just walk us through very quickly, you know, what kind of a pilot is it? Is it a commercial pilot? Is it just a technology viability pilot? Yeah, so it will be for our MVP. Um, one would be with one of the large national health plans. Two are with uh, local hospitals in the Boston area. And so we'll phase it out first, um, interviewing their teams and uncovering their specific workflows um, in order to pick the early use cases. There's a lot that we wanna build that we know we need to start somewhere. And so we've already started the conversations about what the different pilots would wanna focus on. And then after that, testing the, the, what we've developed for them in collaboration with them for feedback. Anything else? So uh, they would be willing to save money by using your software, these companies, and you know that is willingness to pay from them? Yeah, so I worked at a Series A health tech startup focused on value-based care, managing pilots with health plans. My co-founder was a director of product development at CVS Aetna, and so we have worked right in the heart of the runaway costs concern. Um, health plans are really willing to throw money at the possibility that they can save a lot of money. And there is a lot of evidence of what addressing social determinants of health can do for health outcomes. So medical savings for their patient population. But I think the way, like our theory of change working with care worker teams like social workers also addresses productivity and burnout. Um, there's a lot of churn. It takes social workers up to a year to get up to speed. All the expertise lives in their peers' brains from personal experience working with patients. And so we really want to make that a much more streamlined process for their teams. Thank you very much, Bridge Health AI. Thank you. Next. Next, we have BuildX. Good evening, everyone. My name is Geoffrey Mosotinya Kyongora. I'm a graduate architect and a graduate student here at MIT. I'm representing BuildX. And I'd like to start us off by asking a question. Um, who's ever renovated their home, kitchen, bathroom? Who had a really good experience with that? <laughs> Very few hands, and that's what BuildX is about. BuildX was inspired by two grandparents. When I was living in California, um, these two lovely grandparents invited a general contractor into their home. This general contractor took advantage of them. He ended up charging them twice uh, the state average and the project went up um, going three months above the specified time. And this is something that affects millions of Americans every year. And the solution that we're working on is BuildX. It's a user-generated design platform that links vetted general contractors with single-family homeowners using the power of LiDAR and generative AI. We're working on a unique algorithm that can lower the cost of uh, projects by up to 40%. We've spoken to several single family homeowners and 15 general contractors to get the product going. We're excited to show you what we're working on. Our solution is simple, scalable, and it's in a very, very grow it's in a market that's growing extraordinarily fast. Thank you so much. It 
it sounds like you're doing Angie's List in a modern way. Um, what are the, what does your prototype look like? Why would, how would it be modern, different from that? It'll be modern because Angie's List is more or less literally just a catalog, a catalog and a database. But with recent advancements in AI and LiDAR, because we have LiDAR scanners from iPhone 13 onwards and with a lot of Android phones, you can get very, very accurate measurements. And from that, you can also get accurate costs. Um, so that's our unique differentiation in this market. Are you a marketplace? Are you connecting? Yes, we are connecting uh, single family homeowners with general contractors. And where, who are you charging for? Uh, we are charging both sides. The single family homeowners will get charged when they order materials through our platform. And then general contractors pay a very small subscription fee to be able to have access to the single family homeowners that we have on the platform. And do they have to follow your budget? Uh, no. It's a, it has a very unique dynamic pricing model because there are a lot of fluctuations in the market. And that's something that our algorithm does recognize. Once there is a fluctuation, you get up based off of that. And then you can make very, very precise decisions. Look, walk us through. Yes. I'm a single family home. You know, I, I, I want to remodel my kitchen. And, and you were talking about tech enabled. Yes. So what do I have to do? So, excellent question. So your kitchen is a mess. Your general contract has messed you up. You use, uh, use BuildX, you scan your kitchen, you get a virtual model of your kitchen, you can make alterations to your virtual model. They're super accurate and you get accurate costs. But these costs can fluctuate depending on market conditions and supply chain issues. And then you're shown vetted contractors in your vicinity who can do the job. You're not getting anyone who doesn't have insurance who doesn't have a, a registered license, you're not getting criminals into your space. Yes. What's, How do your, you, go ahead. what's your background and your team's background? Um, I am a graduate architect. I've been practicing for the past five years. Um, I'm currently a student here at MIT, I'm doing a Master of Science in Architecture and Urbanism, and some element of architectural computation. My teammate Chang is a practicing architect. He's been working for six years and his expertise is in data science. How do you match up the renders that you generate to the actual materials that go into the house? So there are existing, we are working with a very limited catalog to start off, but it will um, increase as time goes on because we do have accurate estimates based off of these materials. So you start off with 15 materials, and we know that we can give you accurate costing based off of these 15 materials. Yeah. You know, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's uh, basically had these apps uh, wherein you could scan your home and, 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 and they have a bunch of general contractors and, and they have a bigger catalog of materials. So how would you compete with some of them? That's an excellent question. So. Our, our unique market differentiation is that nobody else is doing costing the way we're handling it, using LiDAR and generative AI. Absolutely no one. And this is from experience and from what we've um, reviewed in the market. We've looked at House, we've looked at Homes by Me, we've looked at Hover. This is our unique differentiation, and it's a massive pain point for so many single-family homeowners. Thank you, Build X. Next, Thank Crimson you. Scientific. Quite a few people here. Don't join me, Mark. <laughs> you have my sidekick. Good evening. My name's Mike. I'm an emergency physician, and I've been practicing emergency medicine for over 20 years. I founded Crimson Scientific to reinvent the electrocardiogram. The electrocardiogram, or the EKG, is performed over a million times a day throughout the world, and it's the gold standard test we used to diagnose cardiac disease. However, the technology has two significant flaws. Number one, it's slow. An average electrocardiogram takes over 10 minutes to complete. In the emergency room where we're trying to diagnose heart attacks, time is critical. We have to complete the test as quickly as possible. Number two, it's error prone. 
over 20% of electrocardiograms are flawed because we have to manually place electrodes on the patient's body in precise anatomical positions. Our solution is simple, an autonomous, air-free electrocardiogram. It's a weighted pad embedded with 80 electrodes placed on the upper half of the patient's torso. Uh, electrodes are autonomously detected using signal processing, essentially eliminating the errors associated with manual electrode placement. The data is then collected from the EKG and sent wirelessly to a mobile device for analysis and uh, delivery. This is not just an incremental improvement. Our solution will massively reduce the amount of time it takes to capture an electrocardiogram, and it will also virtually eliminate associated errors. The market in the United States is over a billion dollars. Then this idea was the brainchild of myself, having worked in the emergency department and used EKGs every single day while in the emergency department. I'm fortunate to be accompanied by my brilliant partner, Mark Zachary. He's an MIT graduate student studying computer science and he's getting his MBA from Sloan. Mark has extensive experience in the industry as a software engineer, an AI researcher, has worked for some of the largest firms around medical devices, including Boston Scientific, the Mayo Clinic, and the IBM Watson Lab. We have a provisional patent around the core software technology needed to do autonomous EKGs, and we're ready to develop our hardware. We hope you join us in our mission to improve cardiac care. Thank you, Crimson Scientific. Oh, wow. over, to the, over to the judges. I just I was getting my punchline too, Sam. That was. <laughs> if I think about human bodies and putting a pad on it, do you, how many sizes or shapes do you think you're going to have to have, or is that a one size fits all? So the concept is one size fits all. Uh, men and women will be adjusted for using a pedicle design that would encompass the breast. Um, if you're a smaller person using the single size, it may drape off the side of the body, but it would still cover, it was, you would still get adequate coverage. For pediatric and neonates, there would need to be separate sizes for those. What's the FDA pathway you guys are gonna pursue and what are the primary risks? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take the first part and pass it on to Mark. Uh, we're, we'd be considered a class two device, uh, a 510K pathway based on predicate design around electrocardiograms. Um, we would require clinical trials, trials to validate that our outcome, our product is matches side by side to the gold standard product currently, currently being used. Yeah, and, and there's two main risks. Uh, there's the material side, and then there's also the software side. So on the material, we are uh, working with pressure-sensitive adhesives, so uh, we still need to de-risk that, that side on the hardware design. And then the second part is the software. We do have a patent uh, that basically proves you can use physiological data to identify the proper uh, uh, position using just the electrical signal. So you can draw one-to-one -one mapping between the electrode and the body position that it's underneath. How big is this problem? Like, you know, from, from an emergency uh, room physician's perspective, are you, I, I, you're telling me, is this like 80% of the time this happens, or is it 10%? Yeah. So, um, there's a, the gold standard in emergency medicine, the term that we use, the mantra we use is time is muscle. The less time it takes to get a patient that arrives at the front door to definitive care, typically cardiac catheterization, the better off they do. There's a direct correlation or inverse correlation with outcomes and the time it takes to get there. Literally every minute counts, and that's not hyperbole. Um, EK, so time is of an essence. A current EKG takes around 10 minutes to accomplish, as I mentioned. We're confident we can get ours under two minutes. So the eight minutes, extrapolate that. The second part is the error-prone nature of current electrocardiograms. Some, some literature says over 60% of, of, of EKGs are air, are, have an error associated with them. I gave you the data of 20%, which is a bit more mainstream. The way that's a challenge is if a patient comes to an emergency department today, and I look at the EKG as a physician, and there's an, a change on that, I need to compare it to a prior EKG. That prior EKG may be days earlier, months, or years earlier. With the inconsistency we capture them now, that's a very challenging comparison. Our solution would make that, the, the EKGs consistent. How long does it take to go from prototyping to getting the FDA approval? 
or whatever approval it is? Well, uh, product, the, the life cycle of a medical device, typically from brain to the bedside, is at a minimum around five years. Um, the FDA portion of that, because we have a predicate device and it's 510K, which means we don't, we don't have a novel device that we're reinventing. We have, a, we, have some, we have technology that's based on current technology. So that should be, it, 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 the ranges, but certainly less than a year would be the FDA portion of that, that process. Pretty compelling. Physician. Thank you, Crimson Scientific. <laughs> next, next we have Goalpost. Hello. Okay, okay. Awesome. Imagine a world where athletes dedicate themselves to their sport and their studies without the stress of financial burdens, where small businesses thrive by engaging with their local community. This is possible with goalposts. Many athletes struggle because they need to juggle academics, athletics, and part-time jobs in order to support themselves and their family. And you know, this, this inhibits their performance, their well-being, and, and and their you know, future, future prospects. And at the same time, many small businesses struggle because they, don't, they want to reach out to their community, but oftentimes, especially when they're just getting started, they have trouble with, with finding a platform that they're able to do this with effectively. Enter Goalpost, an innovative online platform designed to bridge this gap. We offer a platform where athletes can meet small business owners and put together an NIL agreement so athletes can monetize their name, image, and likeness with local businesses. In exchange, these small businesses gain the opportunity to engage with their community and create short form, inspiration, uh, impactful content, which athletes post in their own social media pages, and all of their friends, all of their family see it. Join us at Goalpost. We are, we're doing some great things, and um, we're redefining the world of student athletics. We're redefining what it means to succeed as a small business. And we're redefining community connection. Whether you're an athlete, small business owner, or just someone who believes in the power of the community, your journey starts here. Let's change the game together. Thank you. How much would be a micro contract? It feels like it's micro branding kind of. How much would you pay? And how yeah, would you so, if you succeeded? Yeah, so on the smaller side of college athletics, uh, big companies pay smaller athletes about $1,000 uh, for, for one contract. We'd be focusing on small term contracts, which would last about you know, maybe a month. And athletes would post a couple of videos on their social media. We're aiming to provide that, that kind of, I guess, uh, that, that sort of software that they could create these videos with to make it very easy for them. And these contracts would likely be in the range of 50 to to $100 for a couple videos. How would the small business feel success? So, I mean, I guess when I post, I don't, I don't post too often on my social media account, but when I do, um, hundreds of people see it just you know, because of the way that these these apps, these apps work so effectively to, to get people to view your content. Um, and many of these people are in your local community, and this is how businesses grow, right? New business starts, not many people know about it. All of a sudden, someone tells all their friends about it, and all of a sudden, it's everyone's favorite place. So the content is developed with tools on your platform by the small business owner? Yes. Or by, by, by that, the athlete will, will create the video themselves. But of course, the small business can you know, communicate what they want to be included. Um, we also aim to provide contracts and make these uh, agreements ethical for the athlete and as well as uh, legally viable because we want to make sure that athletes don't get taken advantage of as uh, often can be the, the case when you're dealing with the over 8.5 uh, million high school and college athletes and 30 million small businesses in the US. 
and what traction do you have so far? So we've reached out to a whole bunch of athletes. We have um, a, a whole bunch of college athletes here at MIT um, and some high school athletes back home where I'm from. Um, uh, we have, I think, 17 athletes who have committed to being on our platform. And we're also reaching out to small businesses, and we're growing fast. We're getting in contact with more people as we go. Can you just say a little bit more about the small businesses that you've contacted? Or yeah, so I guess we're, we're faced with the classic chicken and egg dilemma, where you know, we're creating a two-sided platform. And so um, we want to be able to present uh, these companies, when we go to them, a large, uh, I guess, diverse portfolio of athletes for them to, to, to choose from. Um, and for a wide range of backgrounds, wide, wide range of sports, we're thinking we want about 30 athletes to, to, to be on our platform to show these small businesses, to show them that we're serious, um, so that they'll be able to commit quickly to, to joining our platform. Why athletes are not just small and upcoming social media influencers? Um, athletes have a whole bunch of, you know, just inherent influence. Like, I'm sure that you know someone who, who, who played football at your local school. These are people that uh, a lot of people look up to, and, um, you know, they, they tend to have, to have more influence. Also, it's local. That's what we're focused on. We're focused on the local industry. We want these, these you know, social media influencers. You know, known, like if someone from Kansas sees what someone in New York is posting, they're not going to be able to go to the local pizza place. Thank you, Goalpost. <laughs> Next up, we have Helix Carbon. Hello, everyone. I am Dave Brown, and I am here to represent Helix Carbon. So the International Energy Agency net zero estimates claim that we need to be capturing and converting 6.2 million tons of carbon dioxide into useful chemicals every year in order to achieve net zero. Our current annual production of these fuels is on the order of zero million tons. And the reason for that is because the path from carbon dioxide to a useful fuel is through electrolysis. And common electrolysis is prohibitively expensive. The cost of energy alone to split carbon dioxide means that classic electrolysis will never compete on price with classic fossil, with fossil fuel chemicals. Additionally, classic electrolysis uses expensive precious metals in their catalysts, and it has problems with electrode plating that lead to really, really expensive maintenance costs. At Helix Carbon, we have made a revolutionary advancement in catalytic technology. We use DNA not as a biological resource, but as an electrical tether, tethering the electrode direct to the catalyst. This opens a new electron pathway that doesn't need precious heavy metals, that doesn't have expensive maintenance costs, and is 30% more energy efficient than the leading electrolyzers today. In short, Helix Carbon can compete on price with fossil fuels. And we, tend to, we intend to take this advance into market by creating modular electrolyzers that serve as drop-in solutions for industry and hard to abate sectors. Our plan is to take carbon dioxide right off the waste stream convert it into a useful chemical, and send it right back into the front of the plant. We are Helix Carbon, and if you believe in a better future, stop by our booth where we can talk about how we can close the carbon cycle together. Thank you. I'm also going to, I'm going to invite my teammates up here, uh, Evan Haas and Ariel first, uh, to help with the Q&A. Thanks, guys. It's great to see you. So tell me how you've progressed in your MVP, and do you have any plants that you're working with? Uh, absolutely. So we do have a small-scale electrolyzer outside on the booth. Uh, we can show that to you. It is not currently running because it's out of the lab, unfortunately, but we can show you how that works. Uh, we are working on scaling up to a larger size, uh, about 1,000 liters per day of syngas created. That, I believe, will be done by the end of the month. Um, we'll have that done by the end of the month. In 
that's going to show it be a proof of concept that will allow us to then, you know, it'll answer our questions about our engineering, uh, which we will then scale up to about a ton of syngas per day created, and we'll deploy that one ton electrolyzer as our base unit that we can stack to whatever side a customer may need. Can you tell us more about the team? I can tell you all about the team. Uh, so we're going to start with Ariel first. Uh, so she is a professor here at MIT. She's got a PhD in chemical engineering uh, from Berkeley. Caltech. Caltech. Uh, kidding. Oh. Caltech. Postdoc. She's a postdoc. OK, that's it. Yeah, OK, not the bad. Uh, so she's the inventor of the technology. Uh, and Evan Haas is a. Is, LGO. Uh, he's getting his MBA and MS in uh, mechanical engineering. And I have a background. I was an undergrad chemical engineer from West Point, and then I spent the last eight years as an Apache helicopter pilot. Uh, so now we're here, and we think we've got the right mix of leadership ability, the right mix of uh, chemical smarts right there, uh, and the right mix what, of experience to bring ourselves to market. Let us know. Um What's your go-to-market plan? How, how are you going to take this to market? Absolutely. So our go-to-market plan heavily involves around kind of the scale-up that I described. Uh, so we are trying to go non-dilutive to build all the way up to the... Um, all, we're going non-dilutive to build our 25-centimeter reactor or electrolyzer. From there, we'd like to go as non-dilutive as possible, but the idea is to get... Uh, we would have to raise funds to get build a one-ton unit and that one ton unit would be deployed at a pilot site. Um, we've ha been in conversations with a few different uh, companies and users who would potentially be interested in our project. From there, once the one ton unit is verified, uh, we'd be able to scale up by stacking more one ton units. I might just add also specifically on the, on the market point, we're, we're targeting the Syngas market first because that's, that's sort of a, the one we, we know, given our, our performance in the lab, is, is already below cost parity with fossil fuels. And so we're going to target methanol plants first because they produce really pure, really clean CO2 effluent, and they need Syngas as a chemical input, and there's just no way to decarbonize that. You can't electrify it because they need it chemically. Um, but from there, it's a relatively drop-in fuel for natural gas in general, and so most plants that require natural gas you know, either as a chemical constituent or as a as an actual sort of a source of industrial heat, um, those are going to be the next the next uh, the next targets. And then once we've built a little bit of scale there, um, we're also going to launch our second product, which is going to be ethylene. Um, it's sort of the largest non-fuel based organic uh, chemical out there, and it's you know quite quite a bit more value, valuable mar molecule. Um, it's just a larger market, and so we, we want to sort of build scale as a startup and then and then target that before we try to compete with, uh, you know, Petrochem. So it seems like government grants would be the way to go. Have you been doing it on that, and do you think you can do that at the pace required, or will you find gaps in that? But it seems like government funding is your way. Yeah. So the initial tech was developed in my lab using government grants, and we've been submitting SBIRs since we've incorporated. Um, and moving forward, we're planning to continue to submit SBIRs. The good thing for us is that pretty much every government agency has efforts in this area. So NASA, DOE, DOD, we've submitted to all of them. And our plan is to continue funding through there as well. Um, so yes, that's a fantastic idea. And we are pursuing it. Thank you, Helix Carbon. Next up, we have Not AI. So, Not AI is a team comprised of me, Shakul, a PhD candidate at MIT, Anup, who is a master student at MIT and Sloan, and Adarsh who is currently a CHPhD student at Caltech and also an ex-IBM AI Watson lab researcher. So let us set the stage. Uh, I hail, tracing back, I hail from a village in India, uh, Bihar, called Ara. And uh, this is a place which is a poster for many other villages. And, there, and it is also a place where 
quality education is a dream for many. The ideal solution for this would be to have qualified teachers who can teach in the local language available locally. But we face two realities. One, qualified teachers are not available locally. Second, there are qualified teachers who are available in areas that are very far, in urban areas, who know the language, who, who might not know the language, but are qualified. We at Nord.ai want to bridge this gap using AI and internet so that students at my village can learn. Our solution can be envisioned like this. Imagine Shakul as a teacher in an urban city, and he's going to teach online to a set of students who's located in his village. Our tool is going to convert in real time the language from his, his English into the local language of Magadhi, which is in his village. As he, and the advantage of this is the student who's at his village can listen to this in local language and even ask back questions or queries in the local language. And our solution is going to translate that to English so that he can answer back the questions or comments, thus closing the learning uh, feedback loop. Imagine her happiness, and that is our vision. Our tech is involves lip uh, syncing uh, technology, text-to-text uh, -text translation, and also voice cloning. All of this is already available. We have two major challenges. One Thank is you. doing all of this Not in real time. AI. Thank you for your time. Sorry. Over to the um, over to the judges. Uh, how do you guys get the data sets for all the local languages to train the models? Yeah. So when we started building this proto, we had came up with this challenge. Uh, so. There is like 22 languages. So one of the languages, there is a small startup that is collecting this data on languages. So we are going to build our proto for that one language that is in one state. And from there, we're going to start off. But the challenge is like la the data for the other languages is going to be a really big issue. How do the teachers feel about this? And who will pay? So the payment is mostly from the governments. So we didn't. So in India, the like each state government kind of controls the funds for the education sector. So we spoke to one of the local state governments in the state of Kerala, and they encourage AI innovation in its, its space. So the payment is going to be from the government space. From the teacher space, we have yet not uh, got a feedback. We spoke to a couple of people from an NGO called Teach for India, which does in the same space. They take people, or they actually take college graduates from faraway places to the local city, I mean, local villages, and teach them. So when we spoke to a couple of people who worked in that role, they felt like this can help them. But the biggest challenge we face is doing it in real time. Because when we did our proto, it's not working in real time. So that is an immense gap that we need to bridge right now. How many students do you think one teacher could be teaching in this new language? Um, not much, maybe less than 10 or something. But the advantage is these villages that we are speaking about, the current students are like 40 to 50 students per grade. So it's not like so much, uh, so much students are already available. And many students are not, I mean, many children are not able to enter the student space because, they're because of the language barriers that already exist in the villages. What, what kind of uh, equipment will the school in the, or, or in the village um, they should have? It's just a video projector and internet. So a lot of villages, especially the state, I'm speaking, speaking about Kerala, the villages have access to internet and it's just video conferencing tools that is required. What age Will you focus for your, for your first thing? And then what age range do you think it would be? And would you need other student teachers in this space? Like, will it really cut down on teachers, the number of teachers required, or will you still need supervision? Um, so we are right now focusing on the grade five, six, seven, because usually in India, like up to that, up after seven, like eight, nine is focused on people get competitive about their exams and stuff like that. So we wanted to first try it out in a younger age population so that our tool is proved out really well. And then we would like to expand to like high school or maybe upper school as well. Yeah. But initially it's just grade five, grade six, grade seven. Uh, have you guys looked at Meta's uh, LLMs and 
do they cover any of these languages? And if so, like what, what percent? So the language I'm speaking about is covered by uh, most of the open AI as well as Llama as well. Uh, we were also thinking about how to build the lip syncing because that's where we felt like most of the trouble is going to come. Because our idea is when, let's say he's a teacher, he speaks in English, the student is going to see him speaking in the local language. And that, there is a research that came out of University of Washington called lip to lip technology. So that is open source available and we are now building a protocol along with that. As well. Thank you very much, Not.ai. <laughs> Next up, we have Neuroscreen. Despite an early stage Alzheimer's diagnosis, my grandmother has slowly forgotten her friends, her grandchildren, and now even her own children. This will be the unfortunate reality for over 15 million Americans by 2050, and yet there's still no effective treatment. Neuroscreen aims to accelerate the Alzheimer drug development process by improving the screening process for clinical trials, which represents over 50% of R&D sped for Alzheimer drug development. The challenge with screening for Alzheimer clinical trials are the strict requirements on the type and stage of Alzheimer's that patients can have to participate, which results in an 88% screen failure rate. Today, screening involves roughly $100,000 in testing costs alone per screen positive patient, thousands of hours of clinical labor support, and one and a half to three years of time. Despite all of this investment, Today, there is a need for over 60,000 patients for active Alzheimer clinical trials, and those are only pharmacological clinical trials. This, repre this represents over a $6 billion market opportunity in Alzheimer screening testing costs alone. We believe that our solution, NeuroScreen, is the answer to this issue. Our AI-based solution intakes routine standard of care data in order to provide interpretable results across the type and stage of Alzheimer's that patients have. That's the critical information needed in the screening process. In our pilot program, we found that our solution could potentially reduce screen test costs by $67,000 per screen positive patient, improve productivity by 50 to 75%, and reduce go-to-market time to, for drug development by potentially half a year to two years. If you'd like to learn more and learn about unlocking Alzheimer drug development, please visit our booth or our website at neuroscreen.ai. And with that, I'll invite my teammate, Chong Kwan, to the stage. Can you describe the product a little bit more? Absolutely. So our product is a web-based AI solution where it intakes routine patient of uh, care data. So if you're familiar with EHR systems, which kind of store all of patient information, our product is able to integrate with these EHR systems in order to provide confidence intervals across the three major stages of dementia, as well as the 10 major types of dementia. These confidence intervals give a sense of what percent chance our solution dictates you might have that condition or that kind of etiology of dementia. And these confidence intervals are broken down into attributable factors so that it mirrors a neurologist kind of diagnostic pathway. So for example, if we say there's an 80% chance that you might have Alzheimer's, and that'll be like that confidence interval, it'll be broken down into segments where 25% is coming from this data point in your EHR, 20% is coming from this other data point, and our solution is also built to kind of integrate with the workflow of clinical researchers who are doing this manual process. Um, so our vision is to have this ranked order list based off the inclusion and exclusion principles that are given to you for your clinical trial. That ranked order list will give you the list of people who are most likely to qualify for your trial. And then that will help neurologists decide who to actually send through the expensive screening process. Ideally, improving the screen positivity rate and doing it in an instantaneous and easy manner.
Your clients could be the pharmaceutical companies? Correct. So our clients would be the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we plan to basically sell this product as a tool for them to use with their subcontractors, which are CROs or private PI organizations that are actually doing the screening process. This mirrors the kind of business plan development cycle that pharmaceutical companies use. Um, and our kind of end users will be the CRO sites or PIs, but the economic buyer are the pharmaceutical companies who have complete control over this process and the budgeting. How many companies are working now on Alzheimer's drugs? How big is that market? Yeah, so there are not that many companies working on this uh, developing drugs for Alzheimer's. I think currently there are five to 15, depending on kind of what size you encompass. However, this is a multi-billion dollar market with each development being billions of dollars in and of itself. And as you might be aware, uh, Eli Lilly recently had a drug that was published to the market, approved by the FDA. But this drug was approved to the FDA only because it was to encourage more development in the space. That drug itself isn't really being prescribed by neurologists because of complications with the drug. So there's a lot of investment and a lot of private and public investment going into this place. And it's expected this market's going to grow. Um, I think the brain, or sorry, the Gates Ventures Foundation, um, in conjunction with the Alzheimer Drug Development Foundation, have just started the Alzheimer's Moonshot program. Um, and that just is kind of a signal of all the investment and attention going into this area. You said that you could save up to $67,000. How much, but it also saves time. So how much do you think this is worth? Like what would be the business model? How would you charge Absolutely. people? So our business model mirrors that of how pharmaceutical companies work in practice, which is basically we charge a usage fee and then most of our fees will be success-based fees based off screen positivity rate improvements as well as screening time reductions. These are kind of standard metrics used in the pharmaceutical company kind of industry and we're kind of mirroring that structure. Thank you, Neuroscreen. Screen. Next up, we have R.E. Shuffle. Hi. I would like to, take you, to, to tell you about Anne. Anne is a senior homeowner that we met last year in South Boston. She's a widow, and she told us that she was struggling financially. She told us that she was facing increase in the cost of living, increase in her medical expenses, and she also shared with us that she wasn't sure if she was going to be able to afford for long-time care. Anna owns her house, and she would like to access the equity that she has built up over the years with her husband, but today she cannot. Unfortunately, there are many people that are in the same shoes. In fact, in the US, there are 65 million senior homeowners, and most of them experience financial struggle. 65 million. And at the same time, in the same market, most people cannot afford a house because of high prices, because of high mortgage rates, and because of low wages. We are trying to bridge that gap with Ari Shuffle by creating a marketplace that connects buyers and sellers on a type of sale that has already helped million, millions of people in France. In that model, the seller is a senior homeowner who will sell their home at a discount, receive an initial lump sum and an annuity for the rest of their lives, but they will maintain the right to live in the house until they don't need it anymore. Unlike a reverse mortgage or other types of equity release products on the market, the senior citizen can age in place without having to do a credit check, without high income interests, without the risk of foreclosure, and without a risk of rent increase, amongst many other things. And the buyer is someone who will invest in real estate at a discount, benefit from the house appreciation, without having to take on a mortgage. We believe that with this product, we could help seniors like Anne tap into the frozen $4.5 trillion in equity that they own, better their lifestyles, and ease the access to the housing market. So together, let's rethink the way we think about real estate. Thank you for your time.
How long do you think the old people live while the person who's waiting for a house and paying exists? I mean, how, what's that duration? Right, so that's a great question. And that's, the entire deal revolves around that idea, right? So it depends on their life expectancy, right? So you're going to, to buy a house from someone, the younger the person is, the higher the discounts, because on average you will wait more to obtain the house. But because it's based on the life expectancy, which is not an exact science, you can wait five years or 10 years or 15 years. And that's part of the culture around the deal. And that's how it's been going on in the last over a thousand years in France. Is it a one-to-one -one match? Like one senior, one owner? So that's the most, that's the easiest kind of structure. Usually it's a, a couple or someone that buys a house from a senior citizen because their husband or wife passed away and the, the retirement that they receive is not enough for them to, to pay for their uh, expenses. But sometimes it can be an institution that buys the house because for many reasons it's, it's also a, a good investment for them. Um, and in some other types of contracts that we might go into more uh, detail later down the road, uh, it can be a couple that lives in the house, but then it becomes a bit more complicated. I am concerned about the safety of of the senior person? The safety? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. And I think that's something that a lot of people you know, think about. And it's a deal that is very, very protective towards the seniors, right? We want them to be safe. And in order to address that safety, we want to make sure that the, senior, the, sorry, the buyers have a strong disposable income, that they have um, their primary home already owned, and it's a, it's a contract that is quite fluid, right? If I'm the buyer and I cannot pay for the annuity anymore, I can sell it to a company or to someone else, and then I, I get my money back, right? So that's something that also people take in consideration, but the seniors that enter into that deal in practice, I don't think there has been a single instance of them being uh, hurt. Do you think this is applicable to other markets? So, that's the study that we are currently doing. Uh, it works in Spain, Italy, France, the UK, uh, Switzerland, Portugal. So it works for Europe. Uh, we are seeing how we can design a product that fits the US market. You know, there are a lot of tax implications, a lot of uh, cultural implications, a lot of uh, legal implications, you know, about the real estate market and all that. But so far we have spoken with dozens of experts in their field and we haven't found a single red flag that would make it impossible. Actually, we think it's quite uh, accessible for now. Where are you on your product at this point in time? Yeah, so right now we have a business plan. We have a draft contract, which at this, at this stage is our product uh, that takes into consideration all the possible possibilities that can happen in such uh, a deal. Um, we are trying to look for VC funding. We have already spoken with five VC firms. Um, and, you know, we want to keep better our understanding of the markets, better understand the, the pain points that our buyers and our sellers have to design a product that fits them well. And uh, how do you plan to drive awareness? Because it's a two-sided yeah. you know, market. One towards the the seniors on one side and to the buyers on the other? Right, so for the seniors, our target market, or initial market would be Florida uh, for different reasons. So we think we will start pretty, you know, um, brick and mortar kind of marketing, try to meet them in person to learn directly from the market. And when we gain a bit more traction, we will go digital and try to reach them through their financial advisors, through their children, through their families. And for the buyers, they could be, you know, bankers in New York, or um, investors in California, a lot of different people across the US. So we will mostly reach them through digital marketing. Can you tell me about your background and the team's background? Uh, yeah, so my background, I'm an engineer from France. Uh, I worked mostly in Africa in the energy industry. Um, and I'm doing a 180 since about a year ago to focus on that idea. So I'm, you know, I've been trying to educate myself on all the related uh, topics around that uh, startup. And my co-founder is a, is a banker in New York. He specializes in uh, mortgage uh, securities and the risk of default. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Ari Shuffle. Next, we have Saki Sim PPL. Hello, 
My name is Swapnil. I'm a postdoc at Boston University and staff at MIT, and today I'm going to talk about Saki, our WhatsApp chatbot, delivering a digital literacy intervention in the global majority. So about 14 million girls across Bangladesh uh, have about 50% of them not aware of menstrual cycles until menarche. And as a result of this, about 40% of them miss a couple of days of school a month, and 14% of them suffer reproductive tract infections. Now, this isn't an unsolved problem. In fact, we have successful examples of interventions that have reduced school absenteeism by 60% and increased menstrual health uh, product uptake by 32%. So what's the problem? Well, these interventions are very small scale. They're very expensive to scale up because they're physical camps, awareness, literacy-focused pamphlets, and things distributed physically. Um, and they require a lot of human resources and capital to deploy. So we built a WhatsApp chatbot that delivers verified and accurate menstrual health information on their phones in real time, in Bangla, in English, and in Benglish, most importantly, a code switch mix. Because typically, when you're typing, you don't type in a single language. You end up typing some words in different languages. Now, our product is in the market right now. We've partnered with a commercial provider. We're using that. Uh, they're a provider of reusable menstrual pads. We're using that to subsidize the partnerships with nonprofits in hard-to-reach regions where we're doing more testing around this chatbot. Um, we've built this product out as a research collective of students from the global majority um, over the past couple of months. And we have received inbound interest from large organizations such as the United Nations Office of the Secretary General, UNICEF, and a couple of other agencies to partner with them to deploy and scale this kind of intervention. We have a moat around the data and the kind of models that we're building out and ask me about my team. Thank you. In the market, what fraction of 14-year-olds do have cell phones, and are they charged per text? That's an excellent question. So the product for them is free to use. The organizations that we charge are the nonprofits that deploy this product in their local communities, which themselves are funded by either found, uh, foundations or larger organizations. We're working on government partnerships, so trying to build out this kind of partnership with the government to uh, deploy this. Of what you said, I believe there are 5.6 million girls with access to WhatsApp, but I, I think that's a, um, an underestimate uh, because typically what happens is in your family you have phones, so you tend to use shared devices, which we don't have estimates about, but like there are adults with access to this, technically 54 million women uh, with access to devices in their family, but yeah. Um, how would this compare to just a general chatbot? Excellent question. So our team has expertise. So that's where my team comes in. I work with students. Last seven years, I've been teaching them. Initially taught them engineering, eventually research. Last couple of years, they came to me saying, how do we have impact? And that's when we started building out responsible computing tools. The team has built uh, models in Indic languages, and we've fine-tuned these models on specific Bengali data sets, sourced both through a com combination of open source data as well as hard-to-find data in local regions, through providers, through startups, um, just unstructured data that we know how to structure because our team built these models at scale. For context, the team that the student came from Two of them have raised about $50 million to build India first um, sort of LLMs. Uh, it's called Sarvam AI. Um, and this guy I taught a couple of years ago, came back, said, I want to work on nonprofit stuff, build products for India in the social good space. So we are fiscally sponsored by a nonprofit, um, launching our own nonprofit, building out this sort of system for social good. Uh, quick follow up. Why do you need to fine tune the models? And, uh is it just for the language, or is there something else? So there are dialects that we want to be specific to. One of the partners that we're doing ad additional research with is a queen of an indigenous community uh, that speaks a dying language. And these people, you're never going to find enough resources to train models for them unless you use one of these facets that we have, which is using conversational data itself to fine tune the models that we create. So creating IP through the deployment of the product, which is a really unique value proposition we can tap into, so why not? So when do you hope to do the first pilot, and how would you sustain yourselves financially going forward? We've done a 50-member pilot, so my wife is Bangladeshi. <laughs> we tapped into our network. We have a, a, our, our educational programs we've run through the last three years. We have 130 students across India, across 22 institutions. 
funded by Google and Mozilla, where we train them through a fellowships program that gives us our target audience to tap into speaking different languages, different kinds of cultures and demographic uh, nuances, which become very important because if your language model tells you to eat meat as a solution for some medical issue, like in India, that's a big deal in some, some states. So that gives us a very rich kind of testing audience itself. On top of that, we have family in Bangladesh who help us test this kind of system out as users who aren't familiar with technology. Go ahead. Well, uh, you basically said a smart thing. Ask me about the team. So tell us about your team. So I've, I've taught students for the last seven years. Uh, I started educational programs uh, in India, and that resulted in the team I have today. So we have a team of 20 core members, mostly undergrads and senior undergrads, two data scientists, one machine learning engineer, myself, I'm a postdoc and staff. I used to work at CERN on production machine learning. Then Adobe, Twitter, I built their technically state-of-the-art misinformation classifier because they haven't open-sourced it, but they open-sourced the other stuff. Um, and then I worked uh, with Meta and on bot detection, and generally my PhD was in uh, fake news and interventions. So that's what I'm deploying now as part of my contribution back. Thank you very much, Saki. <laughs> Next, we have ThinkStruct. Hi everybody, my name's Nikki. This is my co-founder Julius, and today we're here to talk about ThinkStruct. Before we begin, I want to start by talking about my older brother Marcus. Marcus is a PhD student here at MIT, and one of the best th biggest things he likes to complain about is how tedious and difficult the research process is today. The fact is, the journey to the forefront of a given academic field is needlessly challenging, and even for an MIT student. To date, we've interviewed over 50 PhD students and professors and have learned that on average, a given PhD student spends over a year of their, programming, of their program conducting literature review. Now given that year, only a fraction of that time is spent reading papers that are actually of interest to them. Students spend, sorry, students spend um, months of their time um, looking through um, papers upon papers of information uh, just to find specific methods or specific, uh, specific uh, solutions that are just buried under layers and layers of uh, cryptic academic writing. Therefore, we present ThinkStruct AI, a tool to build a highly specific and citable knowledge base for researchers. Using this knowledge base, you can ask general questions, provide points of clarity on things you're confused about in papers, get summary of papers, automatically build bibliographies, and find more related works. Moreover, we promote collaboration. You can join up in a team and share your knowledge bases and build um, orientation and start um, frameworks for the program. I've known Nikki since we were roommates our freshman year, and since then we've spent years in the MIT entrepreneurial community and building our technical skills as CS and AI majors. We, recently, our team has rapidly expanded to many different interns and uh, support here from MIT's Sandbox program. We're revolutionizing the way literature review is done and research is done in general. If you want to join us in this journey, whether you're a VC, you're an entrepreneurial advisor, or you're a willing demo tester for us, please talk to us after the presentations today at our booth. Thank you so much. PhD students notoriously have no money. <laughs> Who do you think would best be interested in paying for great literature review? Thank you. That, that is a, an amazing question. Um, so to start, uh, we plan on adopting a freemium policy for researchers so that they can test our product as we've learned from our research that they very much care about using understanding the framework of the product. Uh, moving on to a, a, a more B2B uh, model, we plan to sell directly to labs. Uh, we want to sell to the labs, and once we collect the data from our demo and from the freemium model, then we can um, propose a very specific uh, quanti uh, quantified value proposition that we can present to them to further um, back up our, our, um, our, our value. What is the current stage of your product? We have a running test up 
test app that is now live, and we've kind of, we've accrued over the past two weeks since that started, we've accrued 30 active users on that test app, and so we are currently talking to them and figuring out how to improve on our test app and developing our kind of next stage um, product. Um, and what would be the benefits of the product over, let's say, uh, off the shelf LLM like Claude? GPT-4, and you just throw in the, the research papers into the context window. So importantly, we're building more than just a chatbot. We're building a tool for researchers to organize their papers and interact with them, very similar to very popular tools such as Zotero and Google Drive, but backed with these AI capabilities. And so we are enhancing more features than just with the chat. And importantly, we are fully basing our outputs on citable and reliable information, something which products like Claude and ChatGPT have yet to do successfully. There's been tons of literature over the past few years pointing out all the different flaws with them. And using our techniques, we can make sure that our information is 100% reliable and 100% checkable. Thank you very much, ThinkStruct. <laughs> Next up, we have Virtuous. Virtuous. Hi everyone, my name is Sienna Xu. As a life design coach, I have encountered countless college students seeking guidance without any direction or purpose. Unfortunately, they're still struggling to look for the help they need within their career, uh, within their university career centers. So there are a lot of issues in their university career centers. So probably a lot of you already experienced something similar with long wait time, limited accessibility, with financial constraints, and huge demand. So virtualists, we're here to support university career centers to provide services with an AI life design coach. So how does it work? When students interact with our AI life design coach, so they have the opportunity to connect their values and their narratives with their past self, and then they can create a compelling life design plan for the future. The question we're trying to examine is what defines you? What kind of person you want to become in the future? And how can we help you to get there with a well-defined roadmap? There are 6,000 universities in the US serving more than 19 million students. And we're looking at an opportunity with 4 billion US dollars markets. And our revenue stream um, is, is generated by the annual subscription of the university um, with the service of a premium and basic products. And our team, we are coming from the Harvard Grad School of Education, Harvard Medical School, and MIT. And virtualists, we believe the mission of life is much more than just finding a good job. And we believe with the AI, with the technology of AI, and we can empower millions of people to redefine a life with purpose and meaning. Thank you. So how are you using software and AI to actually do that? So um, what we envision is um, to use uh, LLM technologies that we first train uh, thanks to uh, the expert that, or you know, we have a live designer, we have a academic career advisors. Uh, based on all the materials that they have, we can fine tune our, model, our models uh, for the purpose of created a live design coach. That's the first phase. And so because they have this expertise, they can properly extract the right information from the data instead of you know just use classical tool that will just say okay well we have a text and okay what's the topic of the text no now we have a actual expert to really optimally use the data to create a good live design coach AI chatbot that's one thing and then uh, we would like to deploy that uh, fine-tune to a particular um, student for instance in this case um, through interaction with the students, through understanding, um, through, you know, <laughs> with interaction through the student, who, how the student behave, how this student uh, responds to certain uh, interactions, um, how to carve the most optimal path um, through, you know, just, just data. 
Um, if you're going to do all that, why not just build like a life coach chatbot? Why keep it isolated to universities? So our service is not just a chatbot because uh, we provide like personalized um, solutions for them. And also we have visuals. Uh, ace. So the, for our premium service, actually we are providing visual aids and also like personalized video to, for them to visualize the possible future. So we are not just a chatbot, like not just textual, but we want to provide immersive experience for the users. And we are planning to extend this into more um, enriched uh, experience interface free. So. Um, Maybe Sienna can also talk about that. Yes, adding on that, so our uh, why it's different between our model and the other model is because we're preconditioned with the expertise of life design coach, which is one category of life of life coach, and uh, um, and also we don't have an opportunity to talk about our vision of our company. So we have phase one, two, and three. For one, it's just a chat box. Um, we under we trying to understand the pattern of the person, what makes this person them, and what value they develop from their past narratives, and design the future path. And how can we do that? So in we. We're going to go to the second phase, which is we're going to use video to um, visualize the compelling future. And with phase three, we're going to use VR technology to design the space around you. So it's, the mission is to design your life in different categories, inside and out. Given sales cycles to universities, why are you not just doing this as a B2C instead of B2B? So um, we because there is a great lead in the institution. For example, I'm a first year advisor at Harvard University. So for the first year, we have around 1,600 uh, students. So we actually have around 300 academic advisors uh, in a one to four ratio for these students. So actually, um, we're trying to have like a full-time uh, equivalent staff for the students. So there's a great need and they, are, they, are, they can afford this money to uh, use this um, like AI service to help them so save a lot of personnel costs. So we estimated that we can actually break um, even our business with like free institution uh, subscription uh, with this model. Yeah, adding on that, there's huge need from, um, so I'm from Harvard Grad School of Education. Um, right now, I'm already doing live design uh, workshops for the uh, teaching and learning lab and also Harvard Housing for all the residents. And I know that they're already using design thinking to train their tutors, to train uh, uh, Harvard College students from different houses. So, so basically, the, the, what's behind life design is using design thinking to design your life like a product, just like see your life, uh, use the engineering thinking to design your life in different care, uh, categories. So I think there's huge need from, from this. Thank you very much, Virtualis. Over to now our last startup, Vercadian. Workforce fatigue and burnout are highly prevalent, but often left unaddressed, causing tremendous life and economic loss, amounting to $400 billion market per year. Existing solutions are all reactive and only act when risk has already happened. Volcadian is leading a paradigm shift, building predictive fatigue risk management to empower a safer, healthier, and more productive workforce with voice AI. We target high safety risk industry, such as transportation logistics, mining, construction, aviation, healthcare. A $50 billion market in US and Latin America. Our voice AI power, BOB SaaS platform, utilizes pro proprietary voice AI to assess fatigue and sleepy needs with, with human speech in 30 seconds. No extra hardware required. Workers conduct regular voice assessment before their regular shifts to gather fatigue levels and performance forecast. It allows manager to optimize the shift schedule and test his patch, thereby protecting employee safety and saving company millions of dollars. In the past year, Vocadia has been com conducting commercial pilots in our target segments with leading customers, such as Anglo America, Foravio, Maersk. We have onboarded five B2B customers, have seven in our pipeline, totaling 2,000 users. And all of our pilot, concluded pilot customers were con converted into paying customers. We're very excited to announce that this month we'll be announcing or launching our first insurance company pilot, which will, which will um, 
expand our capability in terms of risk analytics for professional liability and worker compensation. To make this happen, we have a talented team from MIT, Harvard, Google, and Duolingo with top expertise in speech technology, machine learning, digital health, and circadian science. Together, we're building a future where there's no more workplace tragedy because of fatigue. Tell me a bit more about who you are selling to, not who, are the, who do you sell to? So uh, in the first stage, we're targeting this uh, high safety risk industry uh, company that are directly involved in the front end operations, like long distance trucking, long distance busing, uh, mining, construction, which have uh, heavy equipment operators. Um, These are companies are our direct economic buyers. I'm going to ask you a harder question. Which person or which title within those companies? Who is, who is the uh, buyer? Yeah, usually it's head of safety. Or the risk are uh, also uh, in some companies is head of um, risk management. I think I remember you from the, the previous uh, session, and, and what I'm really impressed is the traction you have received in, in, in the last six to eight months, I guess. Thanks. Yeah, I'm curious to learn more about the, the accuracy. Is it directional, how granular can you get? I know this has been tried in the clinical biomarker space before, selling to pharma companies, and none of that worked. Um, so I'm curious why it works now. Yeah, so we're actually utilizing the proprietary uh, voice biomarker and the machine learning algorithm. There are two sets. The voice biomarker are the uh, special uh, vocal features that are being uh, used to target or diagnose certain symptoms. Um, so voice biomarker research has been emerging since uh, 2019, since the COVID and tele telehealth trend. Um, and we're the first one to actually apply this uh, fatigue assessment in the ambulatory study in, uh, in the field. Uh, and there's also clinical evidence in the uh, clinical trial that uh, proving um, voice biomarker um, be an effective um, indicator of uh, sleep deficiency and circadian, circadian rhythm. How long does a person have to talk? Do they answer questions? Do they talk? How long is that diagnosis piece? Yeah. So right now, because these mostly are shift workers and they have this regular actually safety screening check before their duty. Uh, so um, in our pilot, the average time for the safety uh, is a reading task. It's like uh, 34 seconds. Uh, and also it integrate the safety training content from the company. So at the same time, they're doing the fatigue assessment uh, and the safety training. And you're generating revenue today? Uh, yes, well, we have, we just have uh, in the process of negotiating two commercial contracts with our uh, two concluded pilots, uh, pilot customers. Uh, these are in the uh, mining and uh, long distance um, passing sector. Thank you so much, Vicadian. Now, <laughs> over to you, Brittany. Yeah, thank you all so much, um, especially our teams, for their fantastic presentations and hard work developing their ventures. Um, we'll now enter the voting phase and judging deliberation phase. So for the Accelerate Showcase, you, the audience at the Media Lab today, will decide who out of the 13 finalists will win the $1,000 Audience Choice Award. Um, so we invite you to visit the booths outside and learn more about what our finalists have been working on and have a more personal chat with them. Um, and then once you've heard from the teams, please scan the QR code. They're also placed outside um, and you don't need an access code. And then for food, the buffet is right outside these doors. We'll be announcing the winners at 8.55. Right.
There's some clear I mean, we need to choose and, three anyway, no? Uh -huh. so, and the difference is not that big. It's 10, 5, and... This is just for the 10K. Maybe we say they win. They're in our yeah. top. Let's keep going. Yeah, they're the okay. top. Okay. Yeah, sure. Perfect. I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I
hopefully everyone's had a chance to get some food um, and interact with some of the, the startups and founders here today. Um, so uh, just to review what the prizes are, the first one is Audience Choice Award, which we just got done voting for. That one will be a $1,000 prize. Third place is also $1,000. Second place is $3,000, and then the grand prize is $10,000. Um, and the, the 100K competition, which the 10K launch is a part of, uh, is a student-run uh, student organization. Um, so thank you for coming and, and supporting us tonight. Thank you to our, our judges who have graciously been a part of this event and put their wisdom and thought carefully into the winners. So to announce our first winner, which is the Audience Choice Award, <laughs> okay. When you get your prize, you can come up on stage, and well, they'll take your picture. Um, this one is reshuffle. <laughs> Okay, um, our third place winner is Crimson Scientific. You, you guys can come take a picture, there's no check, but. <laughs> Okay, our um, runner-up is Adelant. Okay, and this one, I'm going to pass it to Ron to announce. It's my pleasure to present the Danny Lewin Prize to Vocadian. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we really appreciate that it's made by the people who come out. So you guys coming out, this is really important. Please look for us at launch. There's a slide right at the end which shows you where everything is happening. If you are interested in competing, there's an interest QR which should come up. Can we tag to the very end? There we go. If you're interested in launch, tag yourself, get on this QR code, have a look. Launch is our main $100,000 competition. So this is the very serious one. You're going to have to go through semifinals to get vetted and then compete, and it's going to be in the massive hall in front of everyone at MIT. If you are interested in the startup community but don't have an idea or interested in what goes on and behind these things, join our team. It's one of the best ways to meet startups across this community. It's one of the best ways to interact and see what it takes to build a winning idea. So join that our team if you want to get involved. Thank you so much to everyone. I really want to thank... Video and AV from MIT for their amazing contribution. This wouldn't be possible without them. I want to thank Lunar, Lunar Catering for all the work they've done, bringing our amazing food, Peak Stand, and obviously the MIT Media Center for hosting us. But finally, and definitely not least, I want to thank our amazing judges for giving up a huge amount of their Monday evening. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. If you, if you competed tonight, please come up to the front, or front stage for a picture.